I'm sure you know that from milk, we can produce cream. And from cream, we can produce whipped cream as well as butter. Now, in the olden days, this milk will have to be left overnight between 24 hours to 48 hours for a layer of cream to form. To make this process work faster, technology was introduced. This was the first milk centrifuge. You will have to rotate this lever here to spin the milk around and once it forms cream, the liquid milk can be removed through this outlet while the solid cream remains in this tank. This is actually the basis for the centrifuge that we use in the science labs today. Welcome to BioWorld. According to our STPM syllabus, we shall learn about the basic principles of differential centrifugation. Differential centrifugation is a technique where we separate cells organelles based on their sedimentation rate. To do this, we will use the apparatus called the centrifuge or also known as the ultra centrifuge. To carry out ultra centrifugation, firstly, we need to prepare a solution containing the organelles that we want to separate. Then we have to place it inside the ultra centrifuge machine. As you can see, there are positions to insert the test tubes, after which we close the centrifuge. And on the front of the centrifuge will be a keyboard where we can key in the speed of rotation as well as the duration. Once complete and we open the centrifuge, the test tube which we placed our solution in will appear like so. You can see sedimentation has occurred at the corner here. Basically, larger organelles would have sedimented whereas the smaller organelles would remain in the solution. Sedimentation here can be affected by a number of factors. This includes the speed of the rotation, we call the roto speed, the size of the organelle that we want to separate, the density of the organelle that we want to separate, as well as the viscosity of the medium in which we have mixed the organelle with. From this result, we can make a number of conclusions. Firstly, we can say that the organelles that are in the solution require higher speeds to sediment, while the organelles that have sedimented require lower speed. The second conclusion we can make is that the organelles that are in the solution are smaller in size. That's why they did not sediment, whereas the organelles that are already in the sediment are bigger in size. The third conclusion is about the density. Organelles in the solution are definitely less dense, whereas organelles in the sediment are more dense. Uh, the density is connected to the viscosity of the medium. Let me use these three spheres to represent three different types of organelles. The one at the bottom here has sank down because it would have a higher density than the medium. So during centrifugation, these organelles can quickly sediment and become separated. So this form of centrifugation is called zone centrifugation. However, we may have very tiny organelles or even molecules like proteins or nucleic acids where they float because they are less dense than the medium or they remain steady in the medium in the form of a colloid because they have the same density as the medium. Now, if we were to separate these type of organelles, then we use a different method called the isopinic centrifugation method. 
as mentioned just now, the organelles can be separated by sedimentation. We call this the zone centrifugation method. In this method, we will use low speed of rotation of the centrifuge and a short period of time. However, the separation is incomplete because we will still have organelles inside the medium. In comparison, we have the sedimentation equilibrium method, which we call the isopinic centrifugation. Here, very high speeds are used and the centrifugation process takes a long time. However, the separation of the organelles or the chemicals will be complete. Here is a diagram showing the process of centrifugation, where you can see we have used different colors to show you that the organelles are arranged according to their different densities. The lower layers have higher density, the higher layers have lower density. Regardless of the centrifugation method used, the same precautions have to be observed. Firstly, the medium used must be isotonic, so usually we use sucrose. The isotonic solutions will prevent plasmolysis of organelles due to osmosis. This way, the structure of the organelle is maintained so that we can study what the organelles look like. Second precaution is related to temperature. We must ensure that the medium is always below 4 degrees Celsius so that the enzymes inside the organelles are inactive. In this way, we can prevent autolytic reactions. Autolytic reactions are reactions that cause the self-destruction of the organelles. So once again, we can preserve structure of organelle for further studies. The third precaution is pH. We must minimize changes in pH by keeping the pH neutral. This is to prevent the enzymes from becoming denatured because once we can separate the organelle, we would like to study the biochemical reactions carried out by the organelles. So although we want the enzymes to be inactive during the centrifugation process, we do not want it to be denatured because once we've separated the organelles, we want the enzymes to become active for biochemical studies. Finally, the centrifuge itself must be maintained at vacuum. That is why it will have a specific closure so that there will be no air inside. This way, we can avoid friction because if friction occurred, it will generate heat and cause the temperature to increase. Let's say we want to study the organelles and biochemical reactions in liver. So, the first step would be to cut the tissues smaller so that they will become easier to homogenize. Homogenization is necessary to break open the liver cells and expose the organelles. We can use a blender, we can use a mortar and pestle, or we can use a machine called the ultrasound. After that, the product of homogenization, which we call the homogenate, will have to be filtered. So we will pour the homogenate into the filter paper. And the larger tissues will collect in the filter paper as a residue. And the substances that contain the organelles will be collected in the conical flask, which we call the filtrate. We will have to place the filtrate into each individual test tube here and then start the centrifuge based on the specific rotation speed and time. Once the centrifugation is complete, when we remove the test tube, we will get a sediment. We will have to pour out the medium and this process is called decant. After we decant, we will have one test tube with the sediment and the other test tube with the medium. This sediment is called the pellet, while the leftover medium is called the supernatant. It is in this pellet 
that we will find specific organelles. So during the first centrifugation step, the largest organelle will sediment. That is the nucleus. The supernatant then is returned into the centrifuge to be rotated once more. Then we will get these two layers. Decanting has to be repeated and the second pellet will have the second largest organelle. So based on the increasing rotational speeds, the organelles that will form in the pellet are, if it is a plant tissue, chloroplast. But in my example, I am using a liver tissue, so there will not be chloroplast. Instead, the second pellet will be the mitochondria. The third pellet will have fragments of the endoplasmic reticulum. The fourth pellet will have the Golgi apparatus. The fifth pellet may have a combination of the ribosomes and the lysosomes. So once the centrifugation process is complete and the necessary organelles have been separated, the supernatant will be left with all the fragments of the cytoplasm, which we call the cytosol. It is only through the ultracentrifugation method that today we know what are the organelles inside a cell, their structure as well as their function. For this, we have Theodor Swedberg to thank to. He actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1926 for inventing the ultra centrifuge. And that is why in memory of him, we use his name as the centrifugation unit. So the S, 70S, 80S of the ribosome actually originates from his name, Swedberg. We can also use a different uh, centrifugation unit that is times G. If we use Swedberg, it actually is referring to the speed of the centrifuge in revolutions per minute. That means how many times the centrifuge is rotating in a minute. But if we use the unit times G, this is referring to the relative centrifugal force. So with that, I conclude today's video. Bye-bye.